Finito, there's someone at the door. God, who could it possibly be? I don't know. Let him in. Hello. Excuse me, sir. There's a yeah. safety issue here. We've got to do a little issue. check, a little essential maintenance to make sure everything's working. Is that alright, Lee? What's working? Everything's working There's fine. There's something in the electrics, okay? Something in the electrics? Yeah, yes, I'm very sorry, sir. It is essential. So you're electrics, you're not careful. Okay. Sir, I can't take that sort of language on the job, but I am afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave the room. Leave the room? I'm very sorry, sir. God, this is most inconvenient doing a video, yeah? Well, yeah. I must apologise, sir. Well, thank you very much for your cooperation, oh, sir. We won't be long, we won't be long. Let's get back to your video very soon. I'm very fine. sorry, but it's essential. Finally! My chance is here! He's gone! It's my time to shine! He's locked me in! Hi everyone! Welcome back to Sam's Explanations. I'm finally here in place of Benito because I'm so much better at teaching you about... What are your... Things. I suppose we've got a north and a south pole, so we must have two poles, so dipole. This makes sense. I... I can do... Can I... Can I do this? I thought I could do... Benito knows how to explain. I can't do this. Oh well. <sighs> do this then. <laughs> right. I'm not good enough. Ah, oh, right now, I'm you alright? I can't do this, Benito. What do you mean you can't do this? I'm not good I I can't explain what you explain. I can't explain like you explain. That's Aww. why it's Benito's explanations. I finally realised. Flattery will get you nowhere, Sam. But... You're not that bad. Be... I'm simply not good enough. Oh, I thought I was good. a star. I thought I was going to be famous. It's good that we've been through this, just so you could realise that. Mm. Yeah, you know? All the negatives that have come off. These videos, I've now turned into positives now you tell me that. What do I do now? Um, What's left for me? I don't know, be a banker or something. Get out of my room, you fool! Blow the neck! Come on! Right, hello everyone! It's okay, it's the sixth video in the Sensory Ecology series and today we're going to look at another sense and it's another one of those weird senses as well. It's one that we can't do and it's kind of weird in general really because despite us knowing about it, for quite a long time, since about the 1800s, um, it's still a bit of a mystery on how animals do it. Right? I'm talking about magnetoreception, the ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field. Okay? And now this is normally associated with behaviours that involve long distance migrations. Okay? For some animals, um, the size of their habitat, compared to the size of their body, for example, is absolutely massive. Um, so, it's, yes, it relates to long-scale navigation. An example being um, the black-browed albatross. Yes, the black-browed albatross mates, mates for life, I think, lays a nest on herd islands. Yeah? And then once all the mating, all the parental care is done, they fly off out to sea, many, many kilometres away. And then each year, they manage to find their way back to the same island. And actually, more or less the same spot from where they laid their eggs the year previously. And that's pretty amazing. Now, how can they be doing that? Well, the magnetic field is the answer. Now, the magnetic field... Well, I'll tell you what. I can't draw. Let's show you a diagram of the Earth. And this is to show you on how the Earth acts as what we call a magnetic dipole. We all know it has a north and a south pole, and that's all due to its magnetic inner core. So as you can see in the diagram, we've got field lines going from pole to pole. That's what connects the two poles. So if you do a geological survey, you realise that the magnetic field isn't homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. It's different where you go from place to place. So that gives us, or gives the animals, something to measure. So then maybe animals are able to orient themselves in an otherwise featureless environment using this. Another important point to mention about the magnetic field is because of the magnetic field that we're alive at all. Okay? The sun bombards us with all sorts of dangerous particles. 
Yeah, it's bombarding Earth all the time. But it's the magnetic field that deflects them. Okay? If those particles were able to reach Earth, um, well, life probably would cease to exist. So it's thanks to the magnetic field that we've got that. Okay, some more examples of pretty animals then. Well, in the UK, we have loads of migratory birds, um, a lot of wading birds, such as knots and sandpipers, which come here to overwinter or come here over the summer. Okay, and if you study them, obviously, nowadays, with technology being so fast, you can fit these birds with little GPS tags, and you can see where they're going, right? And you, it's found that they follow very specific, very population-specific, migration corridors, we call them, okay? So they're following specific routes all the time. So how the hell are they doing that? Well, they could be using the Earth's magnetic field. I mean, they could be using landmarks and things like that as well, but in the sea, everything kind of looks the same, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so there aren't many landmarks around. Another lovely example that we all love is the loggerhead turtle. We love the loggerhead turtles, and most sea turtles actually are thought to be able to detect magnetic fields. Just as a side point, by the way, last summer I was actually privileged enough to release some turtles, um, some baby turtles, as part of a conservation project um, back out into the Pacific. So let's just see some pictures of um, me releasing turtles for a second. Lovely, wasn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Now, these loggerhead turtles have their breeding grounds in Brazil. The female lays her eggs and then phew, she can't be asked with them after that. She shovels off back into the sea, no parental care needed whatsoever. Okay, and then they then, she then makes her way up to Ascension Island, which is just off the east coast of Brazil. Well, I say east coast of Brazil, but that's the only type of coast there is in Brazil, isn't there? <laughs> I got an A star at Geography GCSE. Anyway, so a lot of studies were done, same thing, GPS tags, and it's been thought that the magnetic inclination and amplitude could be being used by the turtle. Because if we look at the diagram for a second, now the thick lines are the lines of equal amplitude, so they're running from northwest to southeast, correct? And then the lines of um, equal inclination are the dotted ones, okay? So, what you can see there is that the turtles could use those two coordinates of intensity and inclination, or amplitude and inclination, together to create um, a bi-coordinate position-finding system. Okay, that sounds all very fancy, doesn't it? God, they're clever, these turtles. So, they're using this magnetic field a bit like a map. Yeah, you know, on a map you've got two coordinates which you follow to get to the place where you want to go, isn't it? Turtles are doing exactly the same. Now, there are suggestions that they could be using the stars as well as a cue. Um, they could also be using olfactory cues. They could be smelling out a sentient island, yeah? But, I mean, like what we talked about last time, it's likely to be this multimodal effect. Loads of factors are likely to be involved. But it does seem pretty clear to us that the magnetic field is a big cue. When looking at any sense in sensory ecology, we need to consider loads of things. So we need to consider what the cues are, which we've kind of explained here, yeah? We need to ask whether there's any behavioural evidence, how these animals detect and perceive information, right? What the thresholds are for eliciting a response, for example. And also, more importantly, what are the sensory substrates? Okay, and it's that final point which is particularly challenging in this subject of magnetic fields because we don't actually know what the receptors are. And that's surprising considering the amount of animals out there which have been shown to have magnetic reception. Okay, even it's not just animals, bacteria as well. Blakemore found this is a compound called magnetite inside bacteria, and it's found to be very important in magnetic reception. Chemical formula Fe3O4, yeah, chemistry, love it. Um, so what he did was he got loads of this bacteria, and he put a magnet at one end, and he watched how the bacteria gradually moved towards the magnet. 
However, these movements could have been passive, couldn't they? For example, if you got two magnets, you know, we used to love magnets when we were kids, and you put one in front of the other, and the other one attracts it like that. Now, is that magnet cognitively detecting the magnetic field and deciding what response to do accordingly? No. It's just attracted, okay? The magnet isn't alive, it's not perceiving the magnetic field, we're just watching the laws of physics in action, aren't we, okay? So we need to describe this boundary. Are the bacteria actually detecting the magnetic field and responding accordingly, or do they just so happen to have magnetite in them, um, magnetite's magnetic, so they're being attracted, okay? You see what I mean? So, an organism must detect changes in the magnetic field and convey this to a motor system, yeah? The nervous system needs to be alerted, central nervous system needs to work what the hell's going on and send impulses to motor neurons and then to effectors so they can respond accordingly. And this magnetite is embedded in a three-layered membrane in these bacteria, so it's been unsure what the function is at the moment. There's also been talk, especially very recently, on cryptochromes. Now, cryptochromes are photoreceptors, um, not just in animals, but in plants as well. And it's been thought that they can detect the electric, um, the magnetic field, sorry, somehow. Okay, so a bit of physics then. Firstly, the magnetic North Pole isn't the same as the geographic North Pole. Actually, they're quite separated. Okay, and we call the angle between them the declination angle, okay? Um, I've written another angle on here, the inclination angle. That's the angle between the measured location, yeah, where you are at the moment, with the horizontal component of the magnetic field, okay? That's called the inclination angle. So, basically, when we do these behavioural experiments on animals, we're trying to test whether they can sort of perceive and act accordingly to differences in declination and inclination angle of the magnetic field. Incidentally, when I equals zero, well that means we must exactly be on the horizontal axis of the magnetic field. And that's what we call the magnetic equator, which is also different to the geographical equator, okay? Basically geography has got it all wrong. Um, now another interesting point to say is that there's instability in the magnetic north pole. The magnetic North Pole changes the exact position of it, it's so, so it changes, that creates instability. Incidentally, actually, the magnetic field of the Earth has switched several times over um, geological time, but that's another story, we won't go into that. So we've talked about it before in the bi-coordinate system of the loggerhead turtle, there's two different types of field lines. There's lines of iso-intensity, iso means the same, so intensity, and also iso-inclination. Now the distance between two, well the change in intensity between two field lines of iso-intensity is about 1,000 nanoteslas. Yeah? The tesla is the unit um, for um, uh, measuring the Earth's magnetic field, okay? or magnetic fields in general, it's tesla. Um, and the angle, the difference in the angle between um, the lines of iso-inclination is about two degrees. That's just some stats for you. Okay, so some proper scientific experiments then. Now, obviously we can't change, we can't manipulate the magnetic field of the Earth, okay? But what we can do is introduce another magnetic field which cancels out that of the Earth's, okay? Well, means that the magnetic field of the Earth is no longer felt because of this new one, okay? And this was done in these turtles in Florida, okay, which normally travel east, okay, and this was studied by Ackerson et al. Um, so what they found was they equipped these turtles with little GPS backpacks, you yeah, know, they looked very cute, and they had them in the lab. And they measured the direction in which they tended to swim in, okay. Now, around this pool in which they had them in the lab, they had introduced a new magnetic field, okay. So what they did in the experiment, they changed the direction of the magnetic field. And what happened was, the two turtles went in the other direction. So instead, they travelled west. Blimey now, they must have been very confused, mustn't they? 
but no more confused than the scientists because we still don't know exactly where the receptors are. Now, a multimodal experiment was then carried out um, with green turtles reaching Ascension Island. Okay? And although this didn't prove exact evidence of magnetoreception, it showed the turtles always seemed to know where they were going. They were going in a straight line all the time, so there was no wandering about, you know, there was no, oh God, let me just check my GPS or something. They even had it very clear on where they were going. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that sometimes they just missed the Sentinel Island. Okay? And then what we think is they sort of homed in on it using olfactory cues. Okay? So this just shows this multimodal effect. It's these different cues acting additively which increase um, the efficiency of navigation of these turtles. Okay, now for some more experiments in birds. Ayoele? I don't know how you pronounce that. Ayoele? Right, they did work on homing pigeons. Now, it's been thought for a long time that pigeons can detect magnetic fields for orientation, especially homing pigeons, because they need to find out where they're going, obviously. So, this experiment was done. So pigeons were taken, frosted glasses were put, in, put over their eyes so they couldn't see anything, and magnets were put around their heads. Okay, so that cancels out the effect of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, that sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? Um, and then a relocation experiment was taken place, because the birds were taken somewhere else, somewhere new, after being anaesthetised, okay? They were given general anaesthetics to, you know, tranquilise them or whatever. And when they, you know, became active again, they measured, well, the scientists measured, what direction they flew off in. And this seemed to give pretty good results about the pigeons being able to use magnetic fields. But apart from it not seeming very nice to the poor pigeon, you know, magnets around their head, frosted glasses, sounds pretty awful actually, it doesn't actually give a good enough picture either, on the behaviour and the sensory capacity of these animals, because you're eliminating everything, okay? So it's not really done under natural conditions. In terms of looking for the behavioural thresholds that we talked about last time, it was found in this study that the behavioural thresholds in changes in magnetic fields tend to be between about 25 to 50 nanoteslas. Now, if you compare that to the difference um, between lines of ISO intensity that we talked about, which was 1,000 nanoteslas, well, then that's much smaller. This just shows that the ambient field is much larger than any local variations that these pigeons are able to detect. Um, and this was looked at further, and it was found, actually, that the pigeons seemed to align themselves in a position which was... Um, where the gradient between the field lines was greatest. To show you that, imagine I have two field lines here and here. The birds would align themselves so they were in this direction, okay? Pointing that way or that way, okay? That's where the greatest gradient is. Oh. Also than that, they could slightly change their place so they can decide where they actually want to go, okay? Now, an even more perfect study was done on a completely different animal. It was done in lobsters, okay, by Lohmann et al. in 1995. And these are migratory lobsters. They took lobsters that were about to undergo a migration, okay? They reared them in the lab, created an artificial magnetic field using what's called a Helmholtz coil, okay? That's probably what was used in the turtle experiment as well. And what they did was they either changed the horizontal direction of the magnetic field or the vertical direction, right? Now, if you change the vertical direction, no change is seen. Nothing happens at all. If you change the horizontal direction, however, then you do get a difference. The lobsters move in the opposite direction. So the fact that we can test two things, one gives the same result and one doesn't, then that just proves how these lobsters are using these magnetic fields. It's a perfect experiment. And just like the pigeon experiment, the eyes of the lobsters were covered, so no visual cues were used. But it was a much more controlled, um, scientific experiment than that used by the pigeons. When I say vertical and horizontal, I mean um, vectors, 
okay, the horizontal component of the magnetic field and the vertical component. Okay, that's what all magnetic fields have. If you remember physics, or your physics teachers used to do that, that a lot, that's Fleming's left hand rule. Um, oh God, you're going to test me now, aren't you? God, what is it? Uh, force, direction of field, current, something like that? Oh my God! Basically what I'm saying is that a magnetic field operates in three dimensions. Okay, well, let's look into some more interesting studies then. A scientist called Bigal went on Google Maps, okay, and looked at fields. And they saw cows in fields, yeah, and she noticed something. She noticed that they were all aligned in exactly the same direction. In fact, she worked out it was a north-south alignment. This hasn't just been shown in cows, it's been shown in two other species, red deer and roe deer as well, when they're sleeping. Why the hell could that possibly be? The truth is, we don't really know. That's interesting though. Magnetite has also been shown in the olfactory systems of salmon. So Atlantic salmon obviously undergo massive migrations. It's all you see on Autumn Watch, right? Shots of these salmon leaping up waterfalls to get to their spawning grounds. It's been increasingly difficult for the salmon to get to their spawning grounds now because of what man's done to our rivers. Okay, but that's not the point. Now, it's thought that they use olfactory cues as well to find out um, where they need to go, because this is natal homing. They're returning to exactly the same spot each year to spawn. Okay? But they also seem to be using the Earth's magnetic field as well, due to this evidence of magnetite in their olfactory system. And this has been shown even further in other species, uh, the rainbow trout, which is a beautiful fish, by the way. And the receptors have even been located. It seems that there are these long chains, about one micrometer in length, of magnetite inside the cells of um, the rainbow trout, okay? And they align themselves perfectly well with the magnetic field. And they're very good and very sensitive at detecting deflections in that magnetic field. This, as I said, is within the olfactory system, the olfactory lamellae, to be precise. So that ties in quite nicely then. So when a, a salmon or a rainbow trout is sniffing out its spawning grounds, maybe it's sniffing and um, being able to take the magnetic field at the same time. That's handy, isn't it? Now, and then neurons can fire an impulse. Brilliant, perfect. The neuron's nervous system is what we need to reach at the end of the day. So that's all very well, but what are the actual mechanisms? We've looked into that a little bit here, but how does magnetite actually influence those neurons? Okay, that's the next step we need to um, solve. And again, it's a bit mysterious, but there's this thing called the magnetite chain hypothesis. Now, as you probably know, a lots of, lots of cellular processes are um, controlled by opening and closing of iron channels on the cell membrane. Okay, so iron channels can open, and then stuff can move in, and blah blah blah. That's basically how a nerve impulse moves along an axon. So perhaps because of this principle that magnetite crystals are oriented differently depending on the position of the magnetic field, then perhaps that could open or close iron channels accordingly, which will lead to the generation of an impulse and eventually a response. Okay, that's the magnetite chain hypothesis. So this spatial coding, which may allow all the vast array of animals that we've talked about, and more besides, there's loads of them, to be able to orient themselves, get to where they need to go on these huge migrations that they undertake, yeah, where it's needed, um, where they need the magnetic field to decide where they're going. Whether you're a loggerhead turtle, you know, using that bi-coordinate system, or a homing pigeon, you know, delivering a message or something. Amazing. Right, that's that for magnetic reception. I'll be back next time looking into probably the most important sense of all, arguably, I don't know, and that is vision. I'll see you then.